Welcome everyone to the May meeting of the Foxborough Historical Society. As is customary, before we begin our meeting, I would ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is the last of our spring series, and once again, we will remain forever grateful to Foxborough Cable Access for hosting the series and tonight's speaker. Before we begin this evening, I would like to take a moment to remember Mr. Charles Clifford, who passed away in April. Charlie was much loved by all who knew him. He also served as president of the Historical Society for three years. Thank you. Uh, the locations for our fall meetings, that's September, October, and November, are as yet undecided. However, we hope that we'll be able to resume in-person meetings at the Boyden Library, depending on the pandemic status. And I would now like to introduce our speaker this evening, Mr. Glenn Field. Glenn has been the warning coordination meteorologist for the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Taunton, Mass, since October 1993. As warning coordinator, he is responsible for ensuring that customers of weather forecasts and warnings are able to quickly receive accurate pr predictions and instructions on how to remain safe. He has worked for NOAA for 35 years. Tonight's talk is entitled Severe Weather, Tornadoes and Thunderstorms. I should point out that tonight's talk differs from the previous talks in that Glenn will be joining us from his home via Zoom and ported to our community TV channels by Foxborough Cable Access. With that said, I will turn it over to Glenn. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and um, uh, and for Cable Access for arranging all of this. Um, uh, you know, I would like to speak tonight about severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. We're getting into that season. And so, again, thanks for inviting me for the next three, four hours. We're going to have a, a wonderful conversation. By the way, it's going to be a long night if you don't get used to my humor. I know it's not four hours. But um, we're also going to talk about lightning. We're getting into this time of year. It's May, June, July, August, where it starts to really heat up. And the atmosphere creates uh, severe weather, well, thunderstorms. And some of them can become severe. And we'll define what that means as we go along. And um, But first, let me give you a little bit of information about my personal background. So I've been interested in the weather ever since I was three years old. Uh, my father was a ship's meteorologist in the Navy, and uh, my mother was an elementary school music teacher. And uh, when the two of them divorced, I would visit him on the weekend, and he'd teach me the capitals. See, I'm pointing to Indianapolis right here. And, um, and geography is very important in learning meteorology as well. But um, you know, he would teach me all about the weather and my mother would get me singing in the choir and acting in the plays and uh, being in front of people and kind of funny how my career became a combination of the two of them, uh, giving presentations to all of our customers, which is pretty much everyone who's interested in the weather, uh, the general public, the mariners, aviators, uh, emergency managers, the media, pretty much everybody. So a little bit about who we are. I work for the US Department of Commerce. That's your federal government. Uh, your tax dollars paid for this presentation. Um, and within the Department of Commerce is NOAA. You've probably seen that little bird symbol that stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Of course, we're the atmospheric side of the house. And then there's the National Weather Service, which is the largest part of NOAA. And our main mission, as you see in the green on the screen, is to protect life and property. 
and the enhancement of the national economy. Nobody ever talks about that one, uh, but that's, uh, of course, transportation and uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, the, the national economy is dependent on the weather. And this is our office. Uh, Jim mentioned that uh, I've been in Taunton for all those years, and that's true. Uh, a couple of years ago, we moved to our brand new office right across the street from our old office in Norton, Massachusetts. So we're currently in Norton. So let's talk about severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Um, and I like to have a little bit of humor along the way. And some of the jokes are corny. <laughs> so be prepared to be annoyed. But, uh, you know, this is New England. We don't get tornadoes here, right? Uh, certainly not like the Midwest. I mean, we get our share of them, but they're, you know, fewer and farther between. We get the really big ones maybe once every 10 years somewhere in Southern New England. But it's not the Midwest, so why are we even talking about tornadoes tonight? Um, well, that's what I like to call the five stages of weather denial. The first stage is, well, that never happens here. It didn't happen in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, for example, in October of all things, back in 1979. Didn't destroy the Bradley Air Museum or anything. Uh, stage two is, okay, it happens but it won't happen to me. Um, certainly didn't tear through downtown Providence in 1986 or anything, didn't destroy the YMCA. Um, stage three is fine. Well, maybe it could happen to me, but it won't be too bad. Certainly won't be a moving experience. Stage four is fine. Maybe it will happen and maybe it'll be bad. And I'm not going to be able to do anything about it. So why should I waste my time trying to get ready? And tornadoes can't strike big cities. Like it didn't strike in New York City in 1976. See, there's the Statue of Liberty. Right during the bicentennial in the Tall Ships Parade. And there's a tornado in Salt Lake City in 1999, uh, very close to the Mormon Tabernacle. There's a water spout that moved on shore as a tornado in Miami, 1997. And just a couple of weeks after 9-11, uh, a tornado came right through and uh, into College Park, Maryland. And you can see the uh, Washington Monument there very close while they're still cleaning up the Pentagon. So then you hear a roaring sound. Helen Hunt goes flying by, Bill Paxton for the women in the audience. And you realize you don't know the first thing about what to do. That's when you've reached the fifth stage of weather denial, which is, holy moly. So let's talk about tornadoes. Here are some statistics. In our area in Southern New England, for the past, that's going on, what, uh, 70 years now. Wow, 1950 to 2020. And you can see in that period, there have been 43 tornadoes reported in Worcester County. Of course, that's a big county. You divide it in half. It fits a little bit more with the other numbers here, 20, 24, 19. There's a little bit of a tornado alley of sorts for New England running from Litchfield County in Northwest Connecticut on up through the Connecticut Valley of Massachusetts into Worcester, Middlesex, and even Hillsborough County of New Hampshire. Not as many down in the southeast, and the reason for that is the cooling effect of the uh, marine air, uh, both from the south coast and the east coast, tends to kind of weaken storms as they move eastward across the area, but not completely. There's even been a tornado out on Block Island. Um, now, this is an old slide, but I kept it in here to give you the idea. Uh, in Worcester County at the time that this slide was made up, there were 34 tornadoes. Of course, we're up to 43 now, but in the last 51 years, which is an average of one every year and a half. And the last one on the list at the time was 1990. And sure enough, Mother Nature made up for it. And there was a tornado in Princeton, Massachusetts. And we're going to show you some pictures from that on Father's Day of 2001. Now, Middlesex County, 
there were 17 and 51 years, which is about one every three years. The last one on the list had been 1986. And just a few years ago, we had the Concord tornado, a relatively weak tornado, but it hit at three o'clock in the morning. And of course, in Hamden County, Massachusetts, out in the Springfield area, there were 16 tornadoes in the last 51 years, about also one every three years. And the last one on the list was 1992, and we know what happened in 2011. We're going to show you more about that. Now, you can do a lot of things with statistics. If you take the real violent tornadoes, those are the, it says F4s, and with now a new scale called EF4 and EF5s. Um, that's the enhanced Fujita scale. Anyway, as a percentage of all tornadoes, Connecticut actually ranks second in the country behind Connecticut, behind uh, Kentucky. And 4% uh, of all tornadoes being violent. Massachusetts was 1.6%. And um, the national average is one. So it's still above the national average. So we don't get them very often. But when we do, they can be violent. And here are some of the violent tornadoes that we've had. Of course, the the granddaddy of them all was the Worcester tornado back in 1953. Of course, that was before we had radar technology, really. Um, but that killed 94 people and injured over 1,200 people. That was an EF, well, on the scale, F4 at the time. And um, then uh, there was a truck stop tornado in 1973, the Windsor Locks, Connecticut tornado in 1979, the Hamden, Connecticut tornado was an F4 in Great Barrington out in Western Massachusetts on Memorial Day of 1995. And of course, the last really big one was in 2011, the Springfield Munson tornado on June 1st, which killed three and injured uh, over 200 people. Now we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about lightning because every thunderstorm has lightning. Of course, it's the lightning that creates the thunder in the first place. And um, there was a study done in, in New England. And uh, so 50% of the cases, it was unknown as to where the lightning injuries occurred. And generally, uh, 20 to 25 people are killed by lightning every year in, across the country. But of the 50% that we knew, the number one place was in open fields, ballparks, and playgrounds underneath trees was the number two place and boating, fishing, swimming out on the water. Water conducts electricity, not a safe place to be. So a typical summer day, cumulus clouds form. And that's just fair weather clouds. But if you watch them closely, they grow and they grow and they start billowing up into what's called a cumulonimbus cloud. And so here's the main storm tower, the updraft, with the air going up here. And uh, what you see at the top is sometimes referred to as an anvil. This level here at the top roughly equates to the tropopause level. What that means is the troposphere is where all the weather occurs down here. And then the stratosphere is way up at the top of the storm and is very stable. The air warms with height as you get into the stratosphere, cools with height as you go up through the troposphere. So that interface is called the tropopause, and that's roughly where the anvil level is. So because it's very stable up in the stratosphere, it flattens out, and that's a very characteristic uh, feature of thunderstorms. Now in this case, though, it's what we call a severe thunderstorm because the updraft is so strong that it's overshooting that anvil level up into the stratosphere. And here's another one over to the right that's overshooting. But if you see an overshooting top above the anvil level and it persists for five or 10 minutes, then that is a severe storm. And that means it's producing large hail, damaging winds, and you can never rule out a tornado as well, depending on the structure. So let's talk more about lightning first of all, because that's what thunderstorms produce. The roar, of the thunder is because the lightning heats the atmosphere. How hot does it heat it? 50,000 degrees. I've never measured it. That's what the book says. 
but uh, that's pretty hot. That's uh, almost 10 times hotter than the surface of the, or five times higher than the surface of the sun, which is 11,000 degrees. Um, so it amazes me though, that lightning goes on the surface of objects and you can actually be revived by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation if it's prompt. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but here's lightning striking the Prudential Center in downtown Boston and the Empire State Building in New York City. And see, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing because they put these uh, things up at the top here, antennas to, to uh, safely ground it down to the ground. You ever hear the uh, expression, lightning never strikes twice in the same place? Well, it does. The Empire State Building sometimes gets struck 30 times in a row because once the atmosphere, once the lightning has dug its channel through the atmosphere, it's very easy to come through the very same path the next time. But it's not always the tallest object. Here's the space shuttle on the launch pad. And there's the tallest metal object there on the left-hand side and lightning striking the base of the space shuttle. And here's the tallest object in a parking lot um, and lightning struck 50 feet away. So it's never uh, living up to all of the sayings. There's a, a church steeple in downtown Providence. Lightning likes to strike tall metal objects. There's an airliner near Osaka, Japan. It's a, a commercial airplane. Sometimes you've been on an airplane and you hear a little pop, lightning strikes, and airplanes get hit all the time by lightning. But in this case, it served as the initiator of the lightning strike because it went both upward and downward from the plane. It was right at the airport and was able to turn around and safely land. 46 people on board, nobody was injured, but uh, did damage some of the cockpit instrumentation. So not, not a good thing to fly in and near thunderstorms, not only from downburst winds, but from a really big lightning strike like that. So as a, as a safety uh, precaution. As a result of this, um, they now take a picture in the cockpit and we happen to have one of the, the uh, pictures here. Just kidding. Just kidding. That's, that's my humor. <laughs> See the plane coming right at him. Okay. Anyway, I told you you got to get used to it. What's the first thing you should do when you feel that electrical charge? Your hair stands up on end to meet the charge in the cloud. Well, Take a picture? No. These people ran down the mountain to safety after they took the picture. Unfortunately, one person was killed and eight people injured that replaced them on this uh, platform atop Morro Rock at Sequoia National Park in 1975. And lightning amazingly struck five minutes later. You'd think it would be instantaneous, but it gave a lot of warning in this case. You don't want to be near trees because they're the tallest object around, especially if they're isolated trees. If you're in a forest, which I don't recommend, but it's uh, actually safer than being near an isolated tree um, because there can be a side flash. Here's a picture of lightning striking a tree and you can see an upward streamer coming up from the tree upward that never made the main connection to the main bolt. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's actually a power line here with an upward streamer as well. The lightning boat goes both upward and downward from the cloud, but where it meets, the, the upward streamer meets the downward streamer, then you get a big bolt like that. So let me dispel this old myth, this old saying, the old rumor that said, crouch down, make yourself as small a target as possible. We no longer recommend that. <laughs> that was taken away years ago. There is no safe place outside. Very, very important. And if you stop to think about it, lightning is coming from 35,000 feet in the atmosphere. And um, you think it's going to make a difference whether it's 34,999 feet because you're crouching? Probably not. Um, the best thing is to go inside a building uh, or even a car. Uh, what is it about the car that protects you? It's not the rubber tires, that's a myth too. It's the metal hardtop surrounding the car that acts as a Faraday cage. If you've ever been inside the Museum of Science, 
uh, you know what I'm talking about, the guy that's inside with the metal on the outside, lightning strikes the outside metal. As you uh, crouch down on the ground, now this is more like a tornado safety rule where if there's nothing else you can do, lie down and cover your head. Um, but this is not a general thunderstorm rule because chances are it's rained, the soil is wet, and wet things conduct electricity. Um, so that is not the thing to do, and every part of her body is touching the ground there. <clears throat> if you're caught outside and can't get to a safe place, first of all, stay away from metal wires and fences. Unfortunately, all these cows were killed because they were grazing right along a metal fence. Lightning can travel long distances <clears throat> uh, uh, along metal. Sorry to say that. Uh, one out of every eight lightning strikes occurs outside the rain area. This is really important. Everybody seeks shelter when it's raining and pouring out there, but it's the bolt from the blue, the unexpected that can sometimes be 10 or even 15 miles outside of the rain area uh, <clears throat> that, that kills uh, unsuspecting people. So the general rule is, if you can hear it, fear it. If you can see it, flee it. And most importantly, when thunder roars, go indoors. And I'm gonna show you a video at the end of this, uh, if we have time, uh, which is my uh, favorite lightning safety video. Just remember when thunder roars, go indoors. There's no safe place outside. There's another great picture of one of our by one of our spotters, uh, Jesse Rudowski, who took a picture. Here's all the rain occurring and lightning striking outside the rain area. The, and it's, you see anything dangerous here? These are pictures just uh, moments apart from each other. And there's actually a jogger out here. And um, this metal pole, uh, uh, this uh, telephone pole, it's the same one that's right here. Just moments afterwards, lightning struck very, very close to that. If you can see it, you should not be outdoors. If you can hear it, you need to be indoors. If you can hear it, you're close enough to be struck. Big implication for the macho baseball soccer coaches say the rain has stopped, so let's get out and play. No. I know it's not the coolest thing, but you're going to say Mr. Field says we should wait another 30 minutes until... The storm has safely passed from the last time that you've heard the thunder. Wait a good 30 minutes. And sitting in the dugout is not safe either. It's completely open. Uh, a good thing to do if, if you can't get inside a building, if there happens to be a school bus parked at the perimeter of the, of the field, then that provides really good protection as long as the windows are shut. Is it just baseball? How about football? This is uh, Virginia Tech Hokies football game back in 2000. Remember Michael Vick? This is his team. Right at the opening kickoff, lightning struck six-tenths of a mile behind the stadium with 50,000 people in the stadium or more. And um, these little lightning arresters at the top of the stadium, they're, they're really not going to do a whole lot. This could have been a real, real serious problem. The game was canceled and nobody miraculously was injured. But if these were metal seats, Imagine what you can do, and not everybody can't fit into the concourse. So this could have been a real disaster. You have to be aware of the forecast. Okay, so that's lightning. Now we've talked about um, how thunderstorms can become severe. So here we're gonna talk about what constitutes a severe thunderstorm by our definition. So what happens if there's Five million lightning strikes per second burns your house down to the ground. Is that a severe thunderstorm by our definition? Well, the answer is no. Why the heck not? Pretty severe to the people that it strikes. Didn't I just say that 25 people are killed each year by lightning? It is the number two weather-related killer nationwide. Number one is actually flash floods. 
but lightning will not cause us to issue a severe thunderstorm warning. If that were the case, then we'd have to issue a severe thunderstorm warning for every thunderstorm because every thunderstorm by definition has lightning. So lightning is not a criteria. Now, if we see a tremendous amount of lightning, we can issue a special weather statement that will scroll on the screen on the Weather Channel, for example, and you'll see something coming from the National Weather Service in Norton talking about this storm in particular being a very strong storm, but not a severe storm. How about if there's 500 inches of rain in an hour? I know it says 50, but I made it 500. What if there's all of Southern New England floating away? Um, that's not a severe thunderstorm either. Please let us know if that happens. <laughs> but um, that actually would cause us to issue a flash flood warning pronto. It would keep our service hydrologist who deals with all kinds of uh, water issues busy for the rest of her career, but it won't cause us to issue a severe thunderstorm warning because rain and lightning is not what we mean by severe. So what then is? Winds that are greater than 58 miles an hour. Why 58? That's 50 knots. A knot is a nautical mile per hour. You multiply by 1.15 to get statute miles per hour. So winds that are 58 miles an hour, that's enough to knock down some trees, large branches, and power lines. Hail that's greater than one inch in diameter, that's the size of a US quarter. So a quarter or larger. And of course, a tornado or any widespread damage, roofs off, shingles missing, windows blown in, things like that. So that's what we mean by severe thunderstorms. Now we have watches and warnings, and people get confused by that as well. So let me explain that. Which is worse, a watch or a warning? Well, I like to say to, to kids, if, you're, if your parents say, I'm warning you, that's pretty bad, right? <laughs> so a warning means that it's much worse than a watch. So a severe thunderstorm watch means large hail damaging winds are possible in the area. Conditions are right for the formation of these storms. But go about your normal business, just keep a close eye to the sky and listen for any possible warnings. A warning though means that we've seen it on the radar or it's imminent based on spotter reports as well from our trained weather spotters. So let's talk about the hail and then the wind. So here's the hail. Hail forms in a thunderstorm where the updraft blows up in a, and then it, it gets carried up and freezes up on the top of the storm. And then the downdraft gets hold of it and it starts to melt. But another updraft lifts it up and it gets frozen again. And the same process happens over and over until it's big enough and heavy enough to fall through that updraft. So therefore we can know that the size of a hailstone is directly proportional to how strong that updraft is. And so if you have golf ball size hail, that's a 56 mile an hour updraft. Imagine if you had three inch diameter hail, that's a 100 mile an hour updraft. That's faster than Pedro Martinez's fastball used to be, straight upward. Okay, so anything that's capable of producing uh, golf ball size hail or larger could also, in the back of your mind, start thinking that it could be so organized that it could produce a tornado. Would this hailstone be severe? Well, let's see, yes, <laughs> oh yes. Four inches in diameter. And what do we need to be severe? Just one inch, the size of a US quarter. So this is four times severe. And our weather spotters are very good at reporting and showing us pictures in real time. One thing we ask our spotters never to report is marble size hail, and you can see why a big difference in the different types of marbles that exist out there. So when you report it to us, report it in terms of inches in diameter. And large hail can do a lot of damage, as you can see here. The largest hailstone we had in Massachusetts was four inches in diameter. Uh, and that occurred actually on the same day as the Springfield tornado 
in June 1st of 2011 out in uh, Windsor, which is in Berkshire County. Now let's talk about wind. 58 miles an hour is severe. We ask our weather spotters though to start reporting when it's about 40 miles an hour, enough to blow some leaves off the trees, just so we get an idea that things are ramping up. So winds uh, are a big problem because of what are called straight line winds. Uh, and that's very common across Southern New England from squall lines. And uh, straight line winds are known as downbursts when they're very strong. And that can cause damage equivalent to tornado. So let's talk about a downburst. A downburst is the generic term. So you've probably heard the term microburst. Well, that's a narrower downburst with less than two and a half mile wide damage swath. And a macroburst can be over many different towns, much more than a 2.5 mile damage swath. But the downburst is the generic term. And here's some examples of what downbursts have done. So when the rain falls down from the sky, especially when there's dry air below it, it evaporates into that dry air. Some of it does. And that evaporation process is a cooling process. When you're in the shower and you step out of the shower, the water evaporates from your skin and you feel cold because it's a cooling process. And colder air is more dense than warmer air. So it rushes down to the surface and spreads out at the surface. And every thunderstorm has an updraft and a downdraft. But a downburst is an extremely strong downdraft. The strongest downburst ever measured was 175 miles an hour. And that was in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Locally here, though, we measured 104 miles an hour in a downburst in Brockton in 1996, and coincidentally also 104 miles an hour at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester in 1998. Here's an example of rain falling and spreading out at the surface. So we investigate things to see whether it was a straight line wind or a tornado. And we'll get to tornadoes in just a moment. But here's an example of a downburst as viewed from the air. You see this building was spread out in a divergent pattern, everything kind of spreading out away from the area. That's evidence of air coming down and spreading out, which would be a downburst, as opposed to a tornado, which has rotation and it's low pressure and low pressure, everything blows in toward low pressure. So this is a tornado track. And if you look closely, you can see uh, whatever this is, cornfield, wheat field, everything kind of blowing in toward one coherent track along the entire path with convergent damage. And that's indication of a tornado. Now, sometimes if you're lucky enough to see uh, curly cues in the field rotation, then you know it was a tornado. Let's go back to 1996, where I said we had a downburst in Brockton. It was uh, pretty impressive. These pine trees uprooted in front of this guy's house on Route 27. 60 people were injured. Fortunately, nobody killed, but caused more than $4 million worth of damage. And 104 mile an hour winds were measured in Abington, very close to Brockton. So I went out and took these pictures. Uh, the storms are still happening in the area to be close, uh, close. but uh, the next day I got to fly in the helicopter. Never again. <laughs> no, nothing wrong with the pilot or anything. It's just that if you ever do this, um, I kept thinking about what, what happens if he has a heart attack and I don't know how to fly this thing. Make sure you have, <clears throat> two train pilots in there. But anyway, here's Route 27 in Brockton. And those are the same two trees in front of that guy's house. Looked a lot worse at the ground than it did from the air. See, most of the trees are standing, like typical of New England damage, very localized. 
And you see another tree over here to the right of the house and another tree off to the side of the picture. And they're all blown down in the same direction from northwest to southeast. And in this field in Abington, the same side of each tree was sheared off. You'd think if it was a tornado, there'd be some on this side and some on that side. But it's all the same side, also indicative of a downburst. But this got us going. This woman's house had leaves plastered all over the front of the house and all over the back of the house. So if it was straight line winds, how to get around the whole house? But notice there aren't any windows damaged. There's no shingles missing. If this was a tornado, you'd think something would be wrong with the house other than just leaves on it. So this is consistent with the downrush of air bouncing off the ground and creating various swirls and eddies um, around the house. Another shot of two trees in the same direction, actually many trees there in the same direction. And oh, and they took me on a nice tour at the time. <laughs> Flew right over Fenway Park. Here's another example of a microburst over Mount Tom out in Western Massachusetts in, uh, in the Holyoke area back in 2014. As viewed from the air, you can see all the trees that were flattened. And um, a little bit about Doppler radar here now on the right-hand side. Um, it gets complicated, but um, the Doppler part of Doppler radar, uh, so here's Holyoke. And of course, Taunton at the time, uh, where our radar was located, it's still located there, <laughs> um, is way off to the east. So we're looking way out to the west. And we can color encode air inside the storm that's coming toward the radar in these green shades. So this air right here is coming toward Taunton. And air that's going away from Taunton in these yellow shades. So that means it's going away from Taunton. Right here, it's going away. So this is coming toward, and this is going away. So they're actually meeting, and this is up at around seven, 8,000 feet. So when the air comes together here, where is it going to go? It rushes down to the ground and creates a downburst. Now, in the case of a tornado, you would see these side by sides coming toward the radar and away from the radar. But here where they're in this position, that's actually indicative of a downburst. And we've been talking about tornadoes, so let's talk now about tornadoes. A tornado by definition is a violently rotating column of air in contact with the ground. If it's not in contact with the ground, what do we call it? A funnel cloud. And when it reaches the ground and does damage, it's a tornado. The new EF scale, that's the enhanced Fujita scale, an EF1, it ranges from zero to five. Uh, uh, zero is 85 miles an hour or lower. Uh, when it reaches 86, that's an EF1. An EF3 is enough to overturn trains, uproot most of forests, and that's in the uh, mid 100 mile an hour range. An EF5, doesn't matter where you are, this is the Wichita Falls, Texas tornado in 1979. The only people that survived that tornado had sought shelter in a bank vault. So this is the enhanced Fujita scale. Just to put it another way, an EF2 can knock the roof off an apartment complex, an EF3, the side walls of an apartment complex, an EF5, pretty much everything is gone. Locally, I already told you about the Worcester tornado. We're gonna to show you pictures from Great Barrington, 1995. And we've had smaller ones around the area Rentham in 2004. Uh, the granddaddy of them all was the Worcester tornado in 1953. <clears throat> yeah, quite a tornado. It was on the ground for 46 miles. It started out by Petersham, went through the Quabbin Reservoir and into the northern part of Worcester and actually uh, spawned a second tornado as it, as it moves southeast. 94 people killed on the ground for one hour and 24 minutes without lifting up. It was officially rated an F4 tornado, but was some question as to whether it was an F5, but they went back and checked and, and still confirmed an F4 because of the construction of the houses 
was not, um, they weren't brick houses for the most part. And the tornado was a thousand yards wide. That's 10 football fields wide. Imagine that. There's a book out, 84 minutes, 94 lives. 26 people were killed on these three streets alone in the northern part of Worcester, the Burncoat section of the city. There's more Worcester tornado damage. Senator John F. Kennedy looking over the damage back in 1953. And uh, this was a big brick building, Assumption College, uh, which went into the uh, designation of EF or F4 rating for that. Most of the houses, though, were not as well constructed. In 1995, we had the Great Barrington tornado out in Berkshire County. You know, uh, we didn't discuss this. Berkshire County is Albany's area of responsibility, and Hampton County becomes the Taunton or the Norton area of responsibility now. And um, so, of course, we're watching very closely. Uh, severe thunderstorms were occurring. There was a severe thunderstorm warning in effect, but a tornado did occur. And um, the <clears throat> so I got to go on my first tornado survey back in, uh, what was this, 1995, right? <laughs> And um, this was definitely a tornado. Uh, this is the Great Barrington Fairgrounds. Uh, pieces of the fairgrounds and white corrugated plastic roofing material were found 45 miles away, away in Belchertown. And a racing ticket was found there as well. You know, in the Worcester tornado, there are stories of frozen mattresses that landed in Boston Harbor. Had been lifted up from Worcester, carried 70,000 feet across the atmosphere, and landed in Boston Harbor. This storm lent a new meaning to the word mobile station. See, things were pretty mobile. I told you, it's my humor. I'm sorry. Anyway, this is, um, you, you can tell it was not an EF5 tornado because there was one pump left standing right there and part of the roof. But um, the damage cost an arm and a leg, I know. Um, these are forecasters from the Albany office that were standing in front of the Big Y supermarket where this truck had smashed into it, creating that new entryway. A terrible, terrible sight at the cemetery. And the media circus, I'll tell you the next day, uh, trying to get in there was something else. Uh, media from all over the country and. I don't know if that was the Secret Service taking a picture of me taking a picture. Just kidding. Anyway, um, this is your former Federal Emergency Management Agency director working with your Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency director, and maybe not the best view of the Western Massachusetts Emergency Management director. That's okay. He knows I do this. This is the back of the mobile station. And you have to look very closely here. So I'm not a great judge of distance. I know that when I walked from one end to the other, couldn't be, it wasn't hundreds of yards. It was maybe 50 feet, 80 feet, something like that. But take a look at this metal pole. If you look real closely on the left-hand side here, where the arrow is pointing, it's blowing in toward the center. It used to say mobile on it. And now on the other side, there's a big metal pole all bent that used to say mobile on it also. See how everything is blown in toward the center of the building. And this is where the tornado went, right through the heart of the mobile station. And then it landed on the mountain here and caused damage about 300 yards wide. But the width of the mobile station was only 50 to 80 feet wide, something like that. So that means this was a small scale tornado within the main tornado. That's how one, one house can be left standing and the one right next to it totally destroyed. There's these small scale vortices within the main tornado. This four by four was driven right through the car. There were three fatalities uh, with this storm on the other side of that mountain. But this was almost the fourth fatality where it punctured the car and ended up right there. And it peeled back the foam rubber seat cushion of the passenger side. See, up at the top there, I don't know if you can see it, is the steering wheel. 
but it slowed it down just enough so that the woman escaped with a serious hip injury and nothing worse. And if we move ahead to 2011, this was the Springfield tornado that we talked about. There's a major rotation going on there. And actually this little ball is what we call a debris ball. In the Midwest, you see these things called hook echoes. There's another one up to the north near Grafton that's trying to get going. Uh, but this uh, was the main storm. And when you see a little ball right at the end of it there, that means that you're actually looking at debris being hurled into the air, pieces of trees and houses. Um, and here's an example of the Doppler radar, what we were talking about, Taunton way out to the east here, looking out to the west, and you see these big bright velocities that uh, was 75 knots off the one side of the scale rushing toward Taunton, and it's adjacent to 68 knots rushing away from Taunton. So that's over 140 knots, which is close to 160 miles an hour of wind at that level, which is up around eight, 9,000 feet. So this was quite the outbreak. It was on the ground for 38 miles and uh, one hour and 10 minutes. As viewed from satellite in space, you could see the, the scarring of the land all the way out to Charlton where it ended up from Springfield to Charlton. And we found other tornadoes in 1997. There's actually a twin tornado in Berkshire County. In 1997, also up in Swansea, New Hampshire, the Cheshire Fairgrounds were hit. Now, this was a, at the time the F scale, F1 tornado. You can see it was made out of aluminum and wood, which is, uh, goes into the, the uh, rating. Certainly not as powerful a tornado as something that would have damaged a brick building. We can see the angles that the shrapnel uh, went into the, the building. And it, that continued on and created an F2 tornado in Greenfield, New Hampshire, a recycling facility that was damaged. Great Brook Middle School in Antrim, New Hampshire in 1998, was hit by a tornado. Northampton in 2000, a weak tornado and a microburst went through uh, this person's house. This was a little tiny tornado in a cornfield down in Ellington, Connecticut, only 15 feet wide. But it actually managed to lift up these little horse trailers and drag them in circular paths on the ground. And then I told you there was a tornado in Princeton, Massachusetts on Father's Day slice these trees in half. <laughs> this was actually the day that there was the remnants of Tropical Storm Allison, which had done a lot of damage in the Gulf Coast region. And then we were having three, four inches per hour and flooding in Attleboro while all of a sudden, this little hook shaped thing up here in Princeton with all those strong velocities coming toward Taunton and away from Taunton right there. <laughs> and it did this damage. So my boss got to fly in the helicopter this time. <laughs> and you could see one coherent track. Most of the trees are standing. That's typical of New England. And uh, where did it end up? Right there, it lifted up right before these big several hundred thousand dollar homes. Uh, so that was pretty lucky. Now in this mess, right at the beginning here, there were two homes. One of the people there were actual Skywarn spotters trained by the National Weather Service to report damaging weather. They waited their whole life for this and their phone line was dead. So there's a case for amateur radio uh, <clears throat> that could have helped get the report in to us. So you know how you can hear the roar of a tornado uh, a mile away? Well, with these big ears, the preparedness cat could hear it 10 miles away. Uh, so. One day she heard that a tornado watch was in effect. That means that the potential's there. So she was listening for further statements and developments on NOAA weather radio. You can get that from your favorite electronics outlet and it broadcasts the weather all the time, it has a warning alarm tone that will go up and wake you up 
if there's a warning. So she heard that a tornado warning was in effect and she told all of her relatives that the storms were coming. Very uh, precocious cat. She even told the dog. The whole household knew the tornado was coming. I told you, it's my humor, I'm sorry. Everyone in the whole town started rushing their loved ones, loved ones to safety. And so the preparedness cat decided to take protective action, put on the helmet. The dog said, come on, let's get down to the basement. That's the thing to do. And, uh, and sure enough, the tornado came and everything was blown this away and that away. The duck was blown right out of the pond, almost hit the tree. The cat was blown right through the fence. I know these were just from greeting cards. I have to have to put a disclaimer that no animals were injured. It's only a joke. It's my humor. Everyone lived happily ever, ever after. And they lived to tell just how big that tornado was. See, I think it was this big. The debate went on for centuries. No, I think it was this big. Anyway, just a couple more thoughts here. The worst place to go is in your car. Mobile home is no better. The safest place is in a storm cellar. What, you don't have a storm cellar? Well then the best, next best place is in the basement. Or if you don't have a basement, on the ground floor, in the bathroom or a closet, put as many walls between you and the storm as possible. And if you're outdoors, cover your head. If you're indoors in a school especially, avoid the gym, the cafeteria, the auditorium, the all-purpose room. Those have large, wide-span roofs that can easily uh, collapse during a storm. Best place is in the interior hallway, away from windows. You ever hear how low pressure in a tornado? High pressure outside, therefore. So you better open your windows to equalize the air pressure, because uh, otherwise you're, when the building will explode outward, uh, everything blows toward low pressure, including your windows. Well, here's the tornado. There's your house with the windows open. Tornado does not care whether your windows are open or not. So we want people to be proactive, not reactive. Here's two pool managers at a place that gets a lot of lightning, so much so that they put a lightning detector right at the pool. And lightning striking, of course, water conducts electricity, not safe, right? And they're not doing anything about it. What do you think? Should we cancel the game? I don't know. Um, when If you're close enough to see lightning or especially to hear it, you're close enough to be struck. Okay, we did the cats. I'll do the dogs real fast. And then I'll show you that lightning video that I talked about. Here's um, Dodger Dog. Good dog, Scottish Terrier. It's alive, just a little shaken up. This is a D0 calm wind. The eyes are open, the ears are perky. A D1, a gentle breeze, 10 miles an hour. A D2, now the hair is matted along the top of the head and the eyes are squinting. A D3, 40 mile an hour winds, the eyes are shut and the mouth is wide open. And we'll see if Dodger Dog withstand the 100 mile an hour wind test. Like I said, he's alive, just a little shaken up. Okay, I know, different dog. Just my humor. <laughs> anyway, um, so let's go real quickly here, if we can. Uh, find it here. To so this video, now I have to just explain it first, and I'm going to plug in my gonna plug in my microphone here, headset. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, reason I do this is that there's music in this video and I wanna be able to narrate over it. So this is uh, a, a, a halftime show. Oh, come on, there we go. <laughs> okay, it's a halftime show in Florida at a football game. And uh, what you're gonna see is that there are several clues that lightning 
could be about to strike. Remember, if you can see it, flee it. If you can hear it, fear it. There's no safe place outside. When thunder roars, go indoors. Don't stay outside. So <clears throat> I want you to see if you can count. It's, gonna, it's a little hard over Zoom here, but all the different instances, that's why I'll narrate it here. It's about a minute and a half long. All right, let's try it. So there we go. Oh, did you see that? That was a cloud to cloud flash. Going to be some cloud to ground lightning in the distance. Right there was a little thunder. That was two clues that you should have been moving indoors already, because if you can see it, you're close enough to be struck, if you can hear it. There was actually a little rumble of thunder there as well. That's your third clue. Now pay attention to the opposing team there. You see them uh, underneath this light pole and trees, a whole bunch of trees right there. Watching for clues. Oh, that was a pretty big clue. Did you see that cloud to ground strike on the left side of the picture? Well, finally, they stopped the music and they're going to move in. No, no, just another song starting. Nobody moving. But for some reason, this team moves away from the light ball. See that? Good thing they did, because lightning struck that tree that they had just been underneath. Had they not gotten the urge to move away right about that time, it would have been 20 dead people right there. Now the football team comes running off the field. Not the musicians though, they're still there. <laughs> Unbelievable. So what did the papers say? Let's see, what did the papers say? Well, first of all, here you can see that there was, uh, I should have had it in a big screen. Oh, well, cloud to ground lightning uh, struck eight seconds into the video. There was thunder at 25 seconds. There was more thunder at 38 seconds. It was a cloud to ground strike a minute into the video, more thunder after that, that's five clues. And then you can see lightning struck the tree. And I don't know what actually ended up happening, why they decided to move away from that tree. It was kind of either luck or maybe they felt some sort of uh, disturbance in the ground uh, electrically. But uh, the tree was still on fire uh, microseconds after the flash. So the paper said the weather was great and it hit with no warning. Well, not exactly true, right? It hit with five instances of warning. So uh, that's my show. Um, I can turn it back over to Jim. I don't know if there's any any questions at this time or Well, I have a comment. Did I turn it back properly? <laughs> I don't know. Can I make a comment? Sure. About the Worcester um, tornado. I remember that. Uh, we lived in Newton at the time, and my parents drove us to see the damage. And I remember seeing a, a, um, a soldier with a, a gun at the end of a street to keep us from going down there. And the only image I remember was out in a field, a bathtub, and then a house with the first floor on the foundation, and that was it. Nothing else left of the house. And then um, I spent uh, three years at the Massachusetts Hospital School in Canton, Mass., a few years later, and there was a girl that attended that school who claimed, well, she had a 
a bad leg that apparently had been damaged during the tornado. And that's it. <laughs> but I remember going there and seeing some of the damage. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. So I, I'd also just like to mention, well, let me take this off. Okay, I'd like well, to mention also uh, where you can get your weather information from directly from our office on, on the web at weather.gov slash Boston, weather.gov slash Boston. Thank you very much indeed, Glenn. That was really great. It certainly, well, you certainly dispelled a lot of misconceptions that I had and the old tales of what to do in a thunderstorm and so forth. Um, that was really great, I thank you. And I look forward to seeing all of you, I hope in person, at our September meeting. And in the meantime, you have a very nice summer. Thank you. Thank you.